It is a uh, honor to introduce uh, Dr. Parag Shah. Dr. Parag Shah, uh, he leads the Pediatric Retina Division at the Aravind Combator uh, location. Uh, he completed his medical college at Samaj's Medical College in India. He then completed his residency training at the Aravind Eye Center in Madurai, and then retina training in Combator. Uh, his arrival to pediatric retina for many, I'll say, of, of his era and generation came not because there were pediatric retina training programs, simply out of a passion. Certainly, these are uh, were for many locations, uh, retinopathy of prematurity, retinoblastoma. These were areas that uh, weren't, uh, I'll, I'll say, heavily or well covered. Uh, and so uh, people from his uh, era really leaned into this, found ways to train, become experts. Uh, he's published nearly 100 publications on the topic and subject. He will be joining us at the Global Ophthalmology Summit uh, in Portland after this. His visit today is part of our ongoing partnership with the Aravind Eye Health System. We have an ongoing partnership that includes training exchanges uh, for our residents and fellows in the past. Uh, there are many opportunities for research engagement as well. So if anyone has ideas, thoughts, uh, you have inquiries, we're happy to pass those along. In addition, we also have the opportunity for clinical observerships uh, for our faculty as well. And if that's something you're interested or engaged in, please contact uh, Craig Chaya, Bob Hoffman, myself, Paul Bernstein, any of us, and we can help facilitate that. Uh, the topic today will be retinopathy of prematurity, tele, uh, telescreening the Aravind experience. As with so many things in ophthalmology, uh, Aravind is an innovative place, uh, forward thinking. Uh, and thankfully, they're, they're not uh, limited by some of the bureaucracy or challenges a lot of other places are. Uh, and they really, as with so many things from intracameral antibiotics to sustainability, have really been leading the way. Thank you for joining us. We're honored to have you. We do have two small tokens. First is our uh, a mug of water if you need a drink uh, during, uh, and then also just a small token of thanks as well here. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Shah. Well, good morning. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, at the outside, I'd like to thank uh, Jeff and the Moran Eye Center for inviting me here. And also the Arvin Senior Leadership Team for nominating me to, uh, to talk on uh, in the grand dance there. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm Paraksha, and I come from Arvinda Hospital, Coimbatore, which is a which is a, a tertiary care satellite hospital of uh, the original Arvinda Hospital, Madurai, which was started in 1997. And I'm a retina specialist uh, with a special interest in pediatric retina, uh, mainly retinoblastoma. I mean ROP and retinoblastoma. And I'll be talking on uh, ROP telescreening experience. Uh, what what we started. Uh, almost a decade back. So uh, I have no financial disclosures. So uh, just want to just recap the history and the evolution of ROP quickly. Like we all know that the ROP hit the high income countries in 1940s when the supplemental oxygen 100% and in incubators were just introduced for preterm care. And it was been given uh, to all the preterm babies and they started seeing this disease called as the retrolental fibroplasia, what it was called then. And in 1956, when Kinsey uh, published his article and they found out that the rates can really be reduced by controlling the concentration of oxygen, keeping it the concentration below 40%. And they did that and, and the disease actually just disappeared. But it reappeared again in the high income countries in the 1980s when, when the smaller babies started surviving. And then they found that it's not only the oxygen, but the prematurity itself and other risk factors which are important, uh, which causes ROP. And this is still happening, undergoing in, in the high, high income countries. In, in the lower and middle income countries, it started hitting in 1990s, late 1990s, and that is the when, uh, when the economy was, was flourishing, and then uh, we started investing in, in, in ICUs and incubators and, and oxygen. So the same uh, evolution happened in uh, India and in Tamil Nadu. I'm from Tamil Nadu, the South India. So this is uh, the Indian Peninsula, the state of uh, Tamil Nadu, which is which caters to around 70 million population. And it hit first in Chennai, the capital of uh, Tamil Nadu, where the NICU started coming up. And after that, it came to Coimbatore. And surprisingly, because Coimbatore is a little more affluent than the other cities of the Tamil Nadu because of the industries there and the NICU started cropping up there. So we started seeing ROPs first in Coimbatore and then it started going to other places like Madurai, Turnal Valley, and now it has gone to all the rural centers of India also. 
And and how has it spread to the rural India? Because in 2008, the government of India came with this uh, thing of starting what they call as the special newborn care units, SNCUs, in all the district hospitals. There are some 800 functioning right now in, in, in the rural district hospitals. And not only that, there are private players who started opening NICUs, approximately two to five, every district uh, center has private NICUs also. So preterm babies were now surviving in rural areas. But unfortunately in India, there are no laws or guidelines that ROP screening should be a essential, a mandatory part of NICU level three, which I guess is the case in the United States. So here, I mean, they can start the NICU without any ROP service. So of, of, of approximately 15 million preterm babies born globally, almost one fourth of them are born in India. India is the highest uh, population in the world now. And approximately half half a million need to be screened and less than, they are around less than 32 weeks and 5,000 need some form of treatment. And this is actually an underestimation because the ROP screening guidelines of India itself are more than 32 weeks. It's around 34 to 36 weeks with a cutoff of 2,000 grams. So the numbers projected are even more than what is shown here. And the ground reality is that ROP experts may be available in the urban cities, but they are really non-existent in the rural areas. And so there's a lot of gap and lacuna, and it's become it, it, it is become a public health challenge to provide ROP services to these rural SNCUs. And that is how the uh, telescreening program started. And before that, a little bit of our history, how we started in Coimbatore. So when NICU started coming up, uh, we had the privilege of uh, Dr. Peterson coming and visiting us, uh, and he, he, he pushed us, the pediatric ophthalmology department, to start ROP screening. And it started, and then... Uh, and, and we were actually doing a free service for almost uh, one and a half decade. And for a simple reason why, because the pediatrician did not want us to be there. They thought we were more of a hindrance. Not, and, and, we were, and they were thinking we had a, a, a motive to get something from their patients, which was, that. so we, 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 we cut off the charge, made free service, and then say they allowed us. So every Thursday, uh, a fellow would go with the indirect ophthalmoscope in the, in the city in ICUs and do the screening. And it's been still done with a very nominal charge now. And, and to increase the awareness amongst pediatricians, we send out ROP information brochures, you know, when to refer to them. And the list was at that time taken from the Indian Academy of Pediatric website. So the service area, we, we started screening all the neonatal NICUs when they started cropping up in Coimbatore, and we followed the local screening guidelines. And once we were strong locally, then we had to expand to the remote areas when the ROP was coming, and there was a need to do that. And of course, the manpower was not there for sending the ophthalmologist, and that is how the telescreening program was born at Arvind Coimbatore, and we called it as a ROPE SOS, like Retinopathy of Premature Eradication Save Our Sight. And it was initially funded by USAID and, by, and then by a philanthropist, Mr. Subhitra Bakchi of a, a company called Mindtree. And the aim of the project in 2015 was to screen 2,000 babies per year in the unserved and rural areas where there's no screening being done. And the team consin, cons, uh, consisted of two managers, two trained technicians, an MLOP, the ophthalmic nurse, which we have, and a driver. And we started the NICUs in nine districts in Tamil Nadu. Uh, Coimbatore comes at... Uh, at, uh, at the state borders of Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So we, we cater to both the both the states uh, of, of population, the patients come to us. So Red Cam Shuttle, I mean, this was the main chunk of investment and almost 50% of the grant was gone buying this equipment, uh, cost around $100,000. And uh, we got this and we started training the technicians, the MLOPs, the, the, in two phases. The first phase was imaging on a, the mannequin, the practice kit, which the the company itself had provided. And after a couple of weeks, we we <clears throat> we, we start uh, told, told them to screen on actual babies in, in a ROP clinic under the care of an observer of the ROP expert. And and once we were confident that they are good enough to do it, then we let them go and start screening in the NICUs outside. And of course, we had to have a carrier to carry this equipment. We had to have a van and a big van actually to carry this bulky camera with the team. And the thing was that, that how do we customize to carry this camera? And then we were concerned, even the USAID was concerned that the roads are really bad in rural India. So what something happens, an accident or something, there's a breakdown or the camera breaks down, what's gonna happen then? The entire program will fold. So we, we had to make a vault inside this van with a special ramp. There were shock absorbers and we, we, we convinced them we can do it. And we actually even ensured the equipment so that if something goes wrong, we have a backup plan to do that. We also had a diode laser uh, in this program, which we got. And uh, we could actually carry this laser for do on-site uh, laser training, I mean, laser treatment if the child is not able to come. And we had a small facility to do in an emergency, in a, in a rare case where 
the laser has to be done inside a van. So we had the facility to do it uh, with the inverter facility and oxygen cylinder. And of course, the, the, uh, the pulse oximeter also was there in, in, in the van to, to do that. We do usually in topical anesthesia. Then the next question was, how do we transmit these images that time? And then there was a lot of brainstorming. We thought Dropbox or something. But then we realized that Arvind Eye Hospital had this diabetic eye, eye, eye disease, the retinopathy screening program. And they had this online platform called the Address, Arvind Di Diabetic Retinopathy Screening Platform. So we thought we can use that. We modified the address thing. And we had a, 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 a survey installed at Arvind Coimbatore. And these are the the modified uh, address where we can put the stages, zones, and all that. And we were, we were so surprised to see this severe ROP coming from the rural India. And uh, in one way, we are pleased <clears throat> because uh, they would never have been screened for ROP, and we could actually do a good service for them. So these were the target districts. It, uh, we kept a radius of around 200 kilometers from uh, Coimbatore in Tamil Nadu side and uh, in Kerala side. And uh, this is what we thought, this, this was practical for us to, you know, the team can go and come back in the same day. And that's what we kept it. But then as the program got popular, more and more districts are coming forward that also we please include us also. So this is the continuum of care. The team will be, uh, leave the base hospital uh, with the red cam shuttle and it'll, it'll, the ROP screening will be done by the trained technician. The digital images will be transmitted to the uh, base hospital via internet. And now it's, of course, the 4G and the 5G. The images will be immediately uh, graded by the ROP expert. There's no stop gap. I mean, <clears throat> it'll be done. Uh, it's a live program going on. If laser is required, then the child will be referred to the base hospital for laser. Or if they cannot be shifted, then the ROP expert will go there with the laser and, and do it, or even if injection is required. The report will be sent back to the SNCU and the advice will be given to the follow-up. So the entire turnaround time is, is around 15 to 20 minutes per child, which is not bad. I mean, the child does not have to come travel uh, with all these issues, what they already have as a preterm baby. So apart from that, to increase the awareness, <clears throat> we started these uh, posters, the patient information multicolor posters to be post uh, pasted where the patient waiting area is there in the SNCUs. And we did that in English and the regional language, Tamil and Malayalam, so that even the mothers know what is the importance of ROP screening and the importance of follow-up, actually. And we made these small brochures also. So if we find a baby who is having an, a, a staged ROP, we would give these brochures to them to go home and read. And, and just to make the importance of telling the importance of the, uh, uh, the importance of coming for a follow-up and not to miss them. This also we had in the regional languages as well. And we had a SMS software, now the mobile phone, uh, everybody has a mobile phone. Uh, now, of course, smartphone, but th that time there was just uh, the, the button phones. And so we used to have a software where, you know, we could send the reminders to the parents just a couple of days before their follow-up visit. That is just a reminder to please come and visit the hospital for your next follow-up of your child. The the screening is, is, is not like a cataract screening where, you know, you do it once in three months or once in six months. When ROP screening starts, it has to go every week to the same NICUs. So the next week when the patient is, I mean, the team is going to go there, we send up these follow-up images, I mean, the SMS. So the project details, we, we could screen more than 7,000 babies of 35 uh, rural NICUs. 111 babies were found with severe ROP. And these are the treatment we give, 129 eyes laser, intravital injections of 84 eyes, and vitrectomy was required in, in, in four babies. This is a short video of... Uh, and just use the mouth. Yeah. There we go. So the red cam shuttle has been taken to the van. And you can see the ramp which is built up. So we can just easily push the machine inside, secure it with the belts. And the team goes in the morning. They already know the number of babies which are there. And this is a Tripur uh, SNCU, which is around 50 miles from uh, Coimbatore. Babies are kept dilated. The red cam, uh, the data has been entered by the technicians. Topical anesthetic drops have been put. The speculum, gel, and, and the images are taken. They are saved, and then, then they are transferred to another uh, laptop and then uploaded on the server. And here you can see the grading has been done on the desktop, and it can be done through a, a, a simple, any, any mobile phone, also Android mobile phone, So reporting, live reporting has been done. 
and it can be done from anywhere with the mobile phone. And it goes immediately back to the report. The printout is taken and the patients are counseled uh, immediately of what needs to be done. So it was quite uh, quick and fast and easy to do. I mean, that's what we wanted. And in case the baby does not come, then we used to take the laser uh, to the site, to the NICU. And then that's the diode laser being carried. And we, we do usually in the topical anesthesia, the child is kept fasting for two hours, give, give sucrose or dextrose through the mouth and with uh, pulse uh, monitoring and, uh, and an NICU staff there. You can see the laser being done in, in, the, in the rural SNCU. So the interesting thing is, apart from ROP, we could find a lot of other diseases also. And uh, of course, the retinal hemorrhages were the commonest one, but we could find life-threatening diseases like retinoblastoma in four patients, one patient with lipemia retinalis, and sight-threatening diseases like cataract, congenital cataract in 26 patients, and, uh, and glaucoma, congenital glaucoma in, in five cases. And these are some of the images of the non-ROP findings. It's a case of retinoblastoma, interestingly, we screened the mother and the mother had a retinocytoma. And, and the next child, actually we said that there's a high chance and we could pick it up if they develop a retinoblastoma. And, and, and unfortunately, two siblings in the, in, the, in, the two, uh, in the same family had retinoblastoma. And congenital cataract, uh, iris coloboma, on the coloboma, the retinal hemorrhages, thysis, there's a hemangioma, congenital glaucoma, we could even find an optic nerve pit albinism, and of course, lipema retinalis. Now, to increase the awareness amongst the NICU staff, we thought we should have a CME program once in six weeks. So all the SNCUs, we thought we should have a program where, you know, we call all the SNCU staff and the NICU and the, and the neonatologist, and one of us will go and give a talk on ROP, and we will involve the, the neonatologist from there to give a talk on their aspect of, uh, of what they are doing, what needs to be done. And we used to have a simple half-day CME program followed by lunch, and it was quite successful. And, and the impact was that uh, the uh, more healthcare providers started referring preterm babies on time. The parents also started demanding of ROP screening, and more ophthalmologists wanted to get trained, and we started a, a short one-month ROP training program. And till now, we have, uh, we have trained more than 110 candidates, not only from India, but a lot of people from outside India also. Another impact was the, the, the importance of using oxygen blenders. Now that is something which unfortunately is lacking, especially in rural India. It, it, I think it's more of a mindset than anything because if they can, if they can invest in SNCUs and, and the entire thing, I, th I don't think blenders are that expensive, but uh, somehow they are not used and a lot of unblended oxygen is given. And this is a case uh, with an aggressive ROP. It's a quite a severe zone one ROP. And look at the gestational age and the birth weight. I mean, these babies won't be even screened by, by the US guidelines. And so this, this came from a previous study, which we, which we published in way back in 2012, that when we started in Coimbatore, we saw one of the NICUs which was giving funnel oxygen connected uh, to the, uh, straight to the uh, central oxygen line without a blender. And the other one was using a sort of a, a hood, which crudely blends the oxygen, not, not as good, but we found a, dramatic difference in the rates of APROP. And we, <clears throat> when we convinced this NICU to convert to blend if they can't, I mean, to hood, if they cannot invest in blenders, we saw a dramatic fall of APROP from 30% to almost 0% in one year's time. So that, that was the impact. And with that, so we started educating more and more uh, NICU staff that this is important for primary prevention. And like I said, when our program got popular, we had more districts being added up here in, in Kerala. And, uh, and in Tamil Nadu, North Tamil Nadu, it went almost to, to Karnataka, Bangalore. And what we had a radius of 200 kilometers, it, it almost increased to 350 kilometers. 
So we started one more team in August 2012 because of the funds which we received from a philanthropist. And we bought a smaller van now with shock absorbers, we can see, so we can keep the red cam there and, and, and take it safely to the rural India. So with increasing burden and other Arundhati hospital branches also started a telescreening, Madurai, Trinil Valley, Thani, and everybody is doing a telescreening, active telescreening. And so now we had a large telescreening network, now a lot of images, so what next? So obviously the most logical thing would be with so much digital imaging, AI would be the other thing to do. And we were fortunate to be involved with this IROP group, uh, which is uh, which is based in US. And uh, it's a fantastic group of uh, Paul, uh, Pete Campbell and Michael Chang. Uh, of course, Paul and P and Mike, I knew from 2006, but now it's been uh, uh, done by uh, Peter Campbell when since Mike has moved to NIH now. And and and, and Paul from UIC has started this fantastic platform called iTelligent for telescreening. And this we use it now, all the Arvindai Hospital use this, where we upload the images on this website, we do a regular telescreening, and they can even test the AI tool from their end. So we started the collaboration in 2017 and we did a retrospective study, which we published in pediatrics a few years back. And the key findings was that, I mean, it worked well even in the Indian babies and on individual eye examination, there was a high diagnostic accuracy for treatment related ROP. And at population level, actually we found higher ROP severity in NICUs, which were not using blenders. And obviously we, we knew that, uh, 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 subjectively, but this is an objective thing that it, it really does make a difference. So it was a proof of principle that AI can be used not only for ROP screening, but as an epidemiology tool to, you know, to monitor the ROP rates in different NICUs. So we tried this again in a prospective way, the two two uh, time, time periods, the previous one from 2015 to 2017, and then after doing all the efforts and all in the same NICUs, we did another survey and, and we found that the ROP, the, the type two or, or worse ROP decreased from 60% to 17% and treatment from 16% to 5%, which was quite dramatic actually. So AI can also be used as a epidemiologic uh, tool and which shows that there's a decline in ROP because of the improvements in primary prevention of ROP. So we, we again asked for more funds and, and we luckily again got funded by USAID and SEVA and which helped us to expand the telescreening uh, to other two tertiary care centers like Tirupati, which is in the other state of Andhra Pradesh and, and Pondicherry, which is again a small state uh, within Tamil Nadu. So we could purchase two more red cams and of course test AI. And we were, we were also to test smartphone based cameras, not only clinically, but even with AI, it can help us. So these are the other cameras which we tested apart from RedCam. The Forest Neo, Forest Neo also is a fantastic camera which is which is manufactured in India. It, it costs I think around and fifty thousand US dollars now in in US. <clears throat> the Peak Vision camera was also very nice. It's like a tono pen and it's a contact method. Unfortunately, it wasn't that great, so we could not test it during our program. And this is a smartphone based MI RedCam camera. So instead of Peak Vision camera, we got another camera called as the MIO. It's a mobile indirect ophthalmoscope um, attached to a, a smartphone, an iPhone. It is manufactured by Keeler. So we compared these two cameras along with the red cam or the forest and the images we trained actually the technicians uh, for a one-man training of how to use these cameras. And uh, the anonymized images were graded by two ROP, by three ROP experts. And we also integrated the grader, uh, the grader based and the AI based the vascular severity score as, as the plus disease. And we found that the sensitivity of detecting infill warrant ROP was 83%, but the treatment related ROP was 100% by even by these smartphone based cameras. <clears throat> Of course, the limitation is the narrow field of view because it's actually an indirect ophthalmoscopy being done through a smartphone. So the field of view is around 40 to 50 degrees all only. So it's insufficient to capture all the stages of ROP and it's non-contact and it requires a little bit of training, especially for a non-ophthalmologist uh, to be trained in this. But it is highly sensitive in detecting treatment related ROP, treatment peripheral ROP. And so it can be used effectively as an ROP screening tool where there is no white field imaging in, or even uh, uh, in-person ophthalmic screening uh, being done, it can be used as a tool. If, uh, and the biggest advantage is it's so cheap. So it can really be, make a big difference. So these are the grand two details. Uh, the USAID uh, grant two, we, we, we screen more than 18,000 babies now with covering more than 100 NICUs, mainly in the rural areas. S 618 babies were required treatment. And you can see the laser in, and of course the intravitreal injections are now much more than the laser uh, now and, and five, seven eyes required a vitrectomy. 
And so we started a ROP telescreening training program also for non-ophthalmologists, for optometrists who want to learn about telescreening. And we train them for a one-month training certified program, not only on white field imaging, but even with a smartphone based if they want, if they want to come and learn there. This is a, a, a frugal smartphone camera, which was uh, which was developed by a, a fellow. Uh, and because they, the fellows used to go for the indirect ophthalmoscopic uh, in, uh, in the in the local NICUs, they didn't have an imaging there. So how do we you know send the images to the base hospital? So he came out with this idea of these um, bottles of of uh, hand drop, which we just just throw it off. So he got an idea of using those bottles as a smartphone based camera. This is just to hold the indirect ophthalmoscopic lens. That's a 20 adapter lens being fixed. And then the nozzle of the bottle, the smartphone camera. And just to make it a little more dark, so I put a black card sheet inside. And it actually gives fantastic images also. And these these are fellows, so they they they're quite good in that, in doing indirect ophthalmoscopy with indentation. So they could get uh, large. You can see this uh, stage the stage three ROP, and this is the indentation which we've been done. This is the ORA serita, and this is the new vessels. <clears throat> so then uh, the IROP group also compared uh, two telescreening population, one from US and India. The biggest one in US, I guess, is in Stanford University, the SunDrop uh, uh, ROP network, and uh, our Arvind uh, telescreening program. And we compared that uh, sun drop with 11 NICUs and 48 SNCUs from uh, India. And we found that the sensitivity was eight, more than 80% for more than moderate uh, ROP, that is pre plus or type two ROP, and showed 100% uh, sensitivity in, in, in both the programs, sun drop as well as the AECS program for type one ROP. And, and the best part was that it actually reduces the physician time because more, more than 60 to 70% are all normal. It's only the, the the thirty percent, which might require, I mean, which has some form of ROP, and hardly five to two to five percent, which require treatment. So this is a really good tool. So uh, AI software as a medical device will be excellent if it can be launched in India because India, leading in preterm birth, still lacks sufficient resources to curtail this burden. And telemedicine with cheaper cameras and application of AI can be a very effective tool to reduce this public health burden, especially not only in India, but there are a lot of other developing countries also which we're talking, which, which lack this and it can be used there also. And as long as sustainability, I think, uh, I think we should involve more of our neonatologists, make them aware of the importance of blending oxygen and the primary prevention. I mean, we are involved as ophthalmologists in secondary and tertiary prevention, but primary prevention should come by the neonatologist. And if they come on board, we can reduce the risk of the babies to be screened and that will reduce our costs also dramatically. And hopefully India also can go back to the, the second epidemic of ROP instead of the third, which is actually a mixture of both the, both the epidemics. And this is our ROP team, uh, our, our chief medical officer, Dr. Narendran, the consultant, Dr. Prema, and, and, and this is actually the backbone, the te technicians. Earlier, we used to tell the nurses to go and do it, but it's a quite a taxing program. Every week going and all, it's quite taxing for them. So we have recruited these uh, technicians, we have trained them, and, and they're doing a phenomenal job uh, doing the screening day in, day out. So in summary, early identification via telescreening prevents needless blindness avoids the visit of the ophthalmologist unless indicated, and it increases the uh, awareness amongst all the neonatal staff. And, and this is the, the baby screen across AECS from last almost 25 years, and we have screened more than 100,000 babies. Uh, and, and, and you can see actually the telescreening numbers, which is less than a decade, has actually outgrown and, 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 and more than 50% of the in-house training, I mean, the screening which we do. And, and on a, in a given week, at, uh, across all Arvind, we screen more than 200 babies in a week and more than 10,000 babies in a year. And, and the best part is that AECS supports the free screening and treatment for government SNCUs. But these are all poor patients. They cannot afford. We can't charge them. So the screening is actually done. And the government also does not pay us for the screening. But after the grant was over, AECS, with its mission to eradicate needless blindness, supports the screening and even the treatment for these poor patients from the next year. So thank you very much. Questions, uh, questions for the audience. Uh, this is from Sean Paul. 
Is the AI technology referenced in the last study at a point where it's ready for implementation in screening programs? If not, what is what needs to change to get to that point? I think it is ready, but the problem is that AI is very disease specific. It will just pick up ROP. It won't pick up other diseases like if you see a retinoblastoma, uh, lipoma retinalis. So as as a as a standalone tool, still I think there's a little bit of more time to you know if you can launch it. But it, it is there. I, I think the IROP consortium has has already applied for the FDA. It's still uh, under process. But uh, I think I hope it comes in the future. But as of now, uh, it, it I think a physician still requires to see these images once, even if the red cam says. I mean the the AI says it's okay. Do you have an estimate for a uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, or at least uh, the catchment area of Arabin, the percentage of babies now being captured in screening from Vietnam's, uh, or perhaps the percentage of hospitals? And then do you have an estimate for the rest of India? So, so the, the question was like, uh, do I have an estimate of number of uh, babies that are screened and then not, not screened in Tamil Nadu in India? So the Tamil Nadu has around uh, 38 districts. So Arvindai Hospital is is covering uh, around 24 of them, and 14 districts are still not covered. So hopefully, when our new hospital Tanjavur, which is going to open in another in another year's time, when it opens up, we will be able to uh, cover the entire state of uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, for India, I I think it's quite variable, and and somehow South India has more of the ophthalmic institutes compared to North India. Uh, and so the telescreening program is extremely strong in uh, in in south, but in north I think it's still a huge issue. A lot of babies in the rural and ICUs are not being screened, and uh, I have my colleagues in in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in, in Delhi, and they are overwhelmed. I mean, they, they see around around four to five stage five ROPs every week. That that bad it is. It, it's quite it's quite bad. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shah, for a great talk. And this is making the program. Are the patients usually treated on site or transferred to a location closer to the treating provider? So, so the question was that uh, is that is it our on site treatment or they are shifted to the base hospital? So, so we we prefer to shift to the base hospital, uh, especially when injections are required, because we know it's it, although it's a it's an outpatient thing being followed in U.S. in India, we do it in an extremely sterile environment in the operation theater. Uh, of course, it's in topical anesthesia only. And uh, we require the microscope, so we would are more comfortable to injecting anti-VEGF drugs in an operation on an OR with a microscope, rather than going and doing it in the NICU. But if the baby is 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 sick and they are not able to shift the child, then we would go there. We would take a special high-risk consent from the from the neonatologist and the and the parents, and we'll tell them. And we have done that also a bilateral simultaneous injections in an NICU. Of course, we try to take as much as precaution as possible, like two sterile drapes and two sets of instruments and different injections, and, and we don't mix and match, but, but the risk is always there. But, but we, we prefer to do it in the base hospital rather than going in the doing in the field as far as possible. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is a great talk, and this is a wonderful program. What government help centrally? You talk about doing things in this area around Arabin in your catchment area mentioned the northern areas that are not, you know, being uh, screened as well. Is there a national effort to help you implement this across the Yeah, so the question was, is there any national government effort being carried out to cover, especially in the northern states of India? Uh, so the thing is that uh, the health is a state issue. It's not, a, it doesn't come under the national, I mean, it does come in the national uh, government can 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 actually give the funds and and start the programs, but implementation is at the state level. The governments are different. The state government is different. The national government is different. There's a lot of political thing happening. So the opposition, if it's there strong in the state, they would say, why would we do with something which the state government, I mean, the national government is starting? So there are issues that the national government is trying, but uh, health is a state issue. So we are not able to implement uh, all these. There are other states where you know the government pays for the screening and for the treatment, 
but uh, in our state, it's not been done. And many other states also, it's uh, because it's a state issue. So they have these state programs also, but then it, it, it's, 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 quite, uh, it's quite volatile and it's not been practiced so uniformly everywhere. So that's a bottleneck. Obviously. Yeah. Sure. Right, it is. Uh, and if you, if you get cheaper cameras and do it, that'll be really good, yeah. That looks like that is all the questions. Okay. Uh, that is amazing. Thank you. Just in closing, just so those of you who don't know, Michael Chang, who's mentioned here, who's gone on to a fame, you know, the National Institute, did his medical informatics training here at the University of Utah and spent time, some time with us here when he was here. That's where I got the one for Oh, okay. That's great. Time. That's great. So we have a local slant on that, that <laughs> aspect. Of right. Mike has been really helpful. Uh, he's a wonderful man. Yeah. And the team is really good. All the three of them are really helpful and go out of the way to support uh, the Arvind Telescreening Program. Yeah. Thank you.